Hello and welcome, I'm Patrick McNee. It's a day for unique arts. Artwork influenced by alien encounters, designs that magically appear in fields of grain, and the mystical art of an ancient religion. Voodoo is generally perceived as tribal black magic practiced in primitive cultures. Images of pinstruck dolls and zombie creatures pervade our thinking. Today, 50 million worshippers of voodoo claim it as a religion with reverence and prayer. Is voodoo a dark, mysterious magic or just another path leading to God? Worshippers of voodoo believe that the work of their gods appears in every facet of daily life and that pleasing the gods will gain them health, wealth, and spiritual contentment. Brandy Kelly, director of the Voodoo Museum in New Orleans, has studied this religion intensively. Voodoo is the compromise between African Udon and, and Catholicism. That's what voodoo is. When African people were brought over as slaves, they took their religion, called Udon, with them. Although the slaves were forced by Catholic missionaries to adopt Catholicism as their new religion, they still prayed to their ancient spirits behind closed doors. The slaves did, however, use the Catholic saints as a cover-up for their own Udon gods, and in time, the two religions merged into what we know today as voodoo. Catholicism, um, Buddhism, all religions have rules. Voodoo has rules. And the rules are harm no one. Protect yourself, but don't harm people in achieving what you want. Voodoo is centered on ceremonies in which the worshipers are ridden or taken possession of by gods and spirits. It's not an evil religion. There's no Satan in voodoo. A lot of things in this religion might look spooky or strange to someone that didn't understand them, but they are here for more than spooky effect. They symbolize things. In voodoo rituals, a priest or priestess acts as a medium between the gods and worshippers. When the gods are summoned, they enter a worshipper's mind and body. The possessed worshipper loses all consciousness, totally becoming the possessing god. The ritual comes to a conclusion when the snake dance is performed. It's a very significant part of the ritual. It's not just done to look scary. The snake symbolizes Dambala, who is the most worshipped and sacred symbol in voodoo. Eshu is the guardian of the crossroads and the more childlike spirit of the gods. He accepts offers like cigars, candy, pennies, and rum. If you cross Eshu, he can throw stones in your path, so to speak. Things like losing your car keys, people here say, that's Eshu. Uh, but if you offer him what he likes, then he can clear your path of obstructions and make you have a much better time at what you're trying to achieve. The god of the cemeteries is Baron Sameti, who represents the ancestors. Without your ancestors, you would not be here today. Without their sacrifices, you would not be here today. So you honor them, you teach your children to honor them. A part of the voodoo tradition in New Orleans is grigri bags. They are commonly kept for good luck or to ward off evil. They are made with small cloth bags which are filled with herbs and oils and blessed by a voodoo priest. They are used to attract money, protect the home, and even to find you love. Men and women both come in to get Greek Greek bags from us. The men wear them on their right side and the ladies wear them on their left side. Those are the power sides for the two sexes. Grigri bags can also be used to cause someone else bad luck, known as putting a grigri on a person. Magic for both good and evil purposes is an integral part of voodoo. Evil in voodoo is merely the mirror image of good. The magic of the spirits is there to be used. Dolls aren't used for what people think they're used for. From Hollywood, it, we get the image that people are sticking pins in dolls to inflict harm or cause evil things to happen. There's the belief in karma that the voodooist adheres to. 
and if they inflict harm on someone else, it will come back on them. So there's absolutely no reason why someone would want to stick a pin in a doll to give someone a heart attack. It, it would make sense. It would come right back on them. Dolls are also for many different purposes. You can have a doll for love, which would normally be a red doll, a doll for fertility. If it's green, it's for money. Um, color significance is very important in voodoo, as well as the use of herbs. And all these things are used primarily for healing purposes. Different colored candles can also be used in conjunction with the dolls and other tools um, for magical purposes. And they really do help you bring to you help bring things to you that you want in your life. It, it does work. Certain aspects of voodoo worship appear fairly ordinary. The altar is covered with candles and ritual rattles, charms, and sacred stones. Even the Catholic saints have their place. Voodoo and Catholic Catholicism are so intertwined, you can't separate them. They're, they're inseparable. Buried in the St. Louis Cemetery is Marie Laveau, the powerful New Orleans voodoo queen of the 18th century. Today, voodoo worshippers still leave offerings of food, money, and flowers at her grave. The cemetery is quite small, but even so, the tomb seems to appear out of nowhere when walking among the crypts. According to legend, Marie still makes personal appearances, frequenting the areas around the cemetery, the old French quarter, and her voodoo haunts. When people ask me, does voodoo work, it's like asking me if Catholicism works. It's a religion. It's not just the magical practices associated with the religion. Um, voodoo is not a grigri bag. It's not a voodoo doll. It's a religion, and all those things are just tools, and they're just part of a religion. Instead of trying to insult the people who practice this religion, just try to understand what they're doing and let them go their own way because I don't think God is going to say, okay, only Catholics are making it into heaven. Reaching the world beyond is a mystery to some and a solution to others. Could a seance be a second chance to resolve lingering conflicts with the dead? Our fascination with death and the hereafter stems from various instances, from seeing ghosts to living through near-death experiences. Some people feel the need to know more about the mysterious world of the spirits. Rose Clifford and Mark Edward are two well-known mediums who help people to contact spirits in the other world. Well, I think people want to reach the other side because it proves that there is another world. I think that in the world we live in, people want escape. They want answers to questions. Spirits of ancestors, I call you forward. Let my words go forth and let us know you are here. So all kinds of things can happen in a seance. You can have physical phenomena with things moving or spirits appearing, noises, apports, things appearing, materializations. People have various reasons why they consult mediums. Some hope to communicate with their loved ones, to be reassured that they still exist. You have um, a, a gentleman who comes and he has a beard. He was bearded. I feel him uh, standing behind you. His, his name was Christopher, I feel. There are two ways in which spirits communicate through mediums. One way is mental contact, which is known as clairvoyant mediumship. A group of people will come together to form a spirit circle. It usually entails short messages from spirits. Now, the name Mariette is coming from a lady in spirit. Marianne or Mariette. She belongs to somebody here. I see the, the face of the spirit coming from the other side. Sometimes I don't. It's a voice I hear telling me who they are. I don't think they enter the body. They, they enter your consciousness. I can't, I can't see because the spirit is not physical. 
I feel the connection comes here in the, um, in the mind. The most spectacular form of communication with the spirits is trance sitting. The medium acts as a channel for the spirit, literally taking over the persona of the deceased person. Charles, are you in this room with us now? Well, that's a very specific area of mediumship. And it's not to be used generally because it's quite dangerous for the medium. One simple thing, you're not supposed to be touched when you're in a trance state. So, and you, you have to have people there who know what's happening uh, because you are not in control of it. Although Mark deals with the more entertaining side of seances, there is still more to it than meets the eye. We will try to cross the ethereal path and to reach the other side. The other world, which I believe is parallel to ours, uh, offers this idea that, well, maybe there's something else. Charles, will you speak through me to the group? He says, Patricia, I forgive you. I think after a seance, people are empowered to maybe accept life more. The guardian spirit is a concept that has been with mankind since the beginning of time. The Chinese called it the great person. The Hindus know it as the chosen God, and the Greek mystics knew it as the luminous self. More recently, the idea of the guardian spirit is known as the silent master. I can't see how we could manage without a guiding spirit, actually. Yes, each, each one has them. Whether we listen to them or not, that's another thing. If you believe that death is the end, the seance could change your mind. Fear of death can be released once we realize that death is merely an ongoing part of our spiritual lives. We cannot bring back the dead. Perhaps a seance, though, opens the possibility of life after death. We could still communicate with them. We just have to go about it in a different way. Through the ages, castles have conjured up a mixture of images, from dragons and dungeons to Cinderella and lavish balls. Well, in reality, castles have housed just such a mixture, and today, they still do. Castles scattered around the world, each of them telling their own story of gore or glory. Set on distant hills, with their massive stone walls and soaring towers, castles house myths about ghosts, honor, evil, and magic. It all started in ancient Europe when the Norse and Teutonic tribes invaded the land. These barbarians were fascinated by the ruins of the lost civilizations and made the broken walls their shelters. The idea of castles had begun. Surrounding them, in the dark forests and infested swamps, lurked monsters and demons. Shadows cast in swirling fog made their imaginations run wild. The legends began. Centuries later, when King Henry VIII divorced Catherine in order to be with the beautiful Anne Boleyn, it was the scandal of the century. Their fiery romance lasted only a thousand days. King Henry met the notorious Jane Seymour, and in order to be with her, he ordered Anne Boleyn beheaded. Centuries later, the castle is still said to be haunted by Anne Boleyn's ghost, walking the path to the guillotine. For hundreds of years, kings and queens reigned in their castles until a blaze of fire and rumbling of thunder began a war in Europe. Castles were destroyed, but people held on to the mysteries and magic of castles. Fantasy their only weapon against the grueling circumstances. There is also the darker side of castles. 
in the haunted corridors and dark dungeons, restless ghosts and demons rule. Dracula is the most famous of them all. In the lonely hills of Transylvania, a morbid castle is his home. As a vampire, he can transform himself into a large bat crawling along the walls of his castle, prowling for unsuspecting victims. His objective? To drink their blood. His coffin in the crypt of his castle guards him against daylight. The sign of the cross and a stake through the heart could end his evil existence. Today, castles are still very much in existence. Although most are not inhabited, standing stark and scary, there are those that still conjure up the magic of fantasy. Far from Europe, in the hills of Hollywood, there is a castle, a magical castle. Entering a room with wall-to-wall -wall bookcases, there is suddenly no way out. But then, whispering open sesame to the gold and blinking owl, you'll be taken back into another era, another time, where strange things happen, where sacred rooms and passages are closed for a reason. There's something about this place, and I don't know how to describe it, but whatever it is, reaches out throughout the world and pulls in all the people who believe in the unbelievable. Every corner and room reveals something strange, luring you to go deeper into the castle. But there are mysterious rooms that nobody can enter, rooms that hold the secret to the wonders of life and magic. This is the absolute inner sanctum for the Academy of Magical Arts. Come with me. To give you some idea of the kind of place we're going, myself as a professional magician, it took me over 22 years before I was actually able to come in this deep into the inner circle. Some of these books, I can tell you, go back to the 15 and 1600s. Um, in fact, this book I know is uh, somewhere around the middle 1500s. It's the, um, the discovery of witchcraft. And it's probably a pretty safe bet you're not going to be finding out what's inside here anytime soon. With the element of castles, anything can happen. And everything is possible. We are only limited to our imagination. After all, a man's home is his castle. And every castle has a king. <laughs> For centuries, men and women have gone to great extremes to ensnare the one they truly love. What are some of the more modern ways to ensure success? Champagne and caviar, candlelight, exotic oils. <laughs> we shall see. Technically, aphrodisiacs don't exist in this country. Yet through many centuries and in many different cultures, Aphrodisiacs have been very much a part of life, just as eating or sleeping. As to whether they'll work, well, that remains to be seen. Love is a universal language. And finding true love has kept humans busy through all ages. For each person to find the key and fall in love with another is what life is all about. Sometimes love makes us do strange things. We will try nearly anything to catch our true love. In former eras, magicians cast spells or created love potions. One potion to seduce the object of your desire was a mixture of dove's heart, sparrow's liver, swallow's womb, and hare's kidney mixed with your own blood. In practical magic today, we can cast a magic circle following the age-old tradition, which is wise men and magicians made the circle to keep out the darkness and focus inward on light and truth. 
Drawing the magic circle of love is done according to ritual with all the correct implements. You draw the circle at night under the glow of the moonlight. At each of the four points, north, south, east, and west, place the symbols for the four elements of love. The element of fire is south and represented by a scent burner. For north, the element of earth is represented by seasonal fruit. For east, the element of air is represented by a mirror. And for west, the element of water is represented by a chalice of wine. Place the 22 major arcana cards from a tarot deck around the circle. With four candles at each of the four points, you are ready to begin. Light the candles. When you feel ready, acknowledge the presence of the four elements. After you say the ritual words, sit in the center and focus on the question at hand. Let your mind rest while you wait for an answer from one of the four elements. You can feel the answer with your heart or see it in your mind's eye. When you feel the element has answered you, let your hand be guided to a tarot card. Your reading will help you make the right magical essence or love potion. The love potions are filled with magic and herbs we still know very little about. There's a love potion for almost every kind of love. To find your true love, to heal old wounds, or to open your heart to passion. Making love potions requires certain tools. It is best to use ones made of silver since silver is consecrated by the moon. While some of the potions call for unusual herbs, most use common ingredients like cherry blossoms, dried flowers, and wine. During preparation, you always follow your creation with a special incantation. Whether you say these words silently or aloud, they are important for the magic to work. In the quiet of the moon, with the flowers that there bloom, then we say the true words soon. The potion is now ready. If spellcasting doesn't work for you, there's a magical tea made with a new FDA-approved serum called Eros, the drink of love. At a gathering in Studio City, California, people from all walks of life came to learn about Eros or give a testimonial of its effectiveness. It lasted about six or eight hours for me. Okay, that was... And that was quite quick. I don't care if this villain ever leaves. We better go upstairs right now. <laughs> can't spike a drink with this stuff and make anybody's brain no. say, oh, whoopee. I did feel a sort of tenderness in the breast area and a more sensual feeling. And uh, definitely, uh, if you're with somebody, you're going to get more out of it because it's like an amplifier. The more you put into it, That's the more right. you get out of it. Eros comes in liquid form in a small plastic ampule. You take the ampule, break it over a cup with warm water, and drink it like a tea. You'll feel the effects of the herbal mixture shortly thereafter. So Smilax is a very safe form of testosterone, which absorbed through the, the mucous membranes of the mouth, what they call sublingually, can get into the bloodstream and very naturally and gracefully boost the hormone levels, which then encourages the sexual drive. When you kick into gear your own your own uh, forces uh, in, in an encounter situation, then this herbal-based product will enhance whatever it is that you're going to do or feel. I wonder if people really need such an enhancement. I mean, aren't our natural forces good enough? We are so distracted in our, in our current times with stress and workload and frustration. And, of course, the news is constantly giving us all these terrible events. You get kind of burned out. And this kind of refocuses you back to maybe like you were when you were 18 or 19. And you had no cares and you had no worries. And things were really up and coming. So anyway, I'm going to give one of these a shot and see what happens here. Well, here goes to love. The earth produces all kinds of wonders, from medicinal plants to spectacular geological formations. One such wonder found deep in the underground is the crystal, whose natural properties release vibrational energies that can be a powerful healing tool. It looks simple enough, but some say the power in a crystal is a potent healing tool. 
In fact, crystals have long been used for healing, whether crushed up and swallowed or simply placed on your body. As far back as 150 million years ago, even dinosaurs knew about the crystal's healing energies. A crushed crystal aided their digestion. Since then, crystal healing has reached people. Placed in particular formation on the body, crystals vibrate at frequencies invisible to the human senses. While crystals are used differently for a variety of purposes, Rena Joy from Hermosa Beach, California, sees them as a tool for her work. I do what's commonly called as energy healing, uh, but what I do encompasses a little bit more than maybe most energy healing, because energy healing is generally channeling of energy to heal and balance um, the aura. But what I also do is higher self channeling. Rena's healing practice has reached many people in search of a higher understanding of life. Former clients have now become students eager to learn her style of healing. So I, I never know what I'm going to do until I start working on someone. And I feel, I can feel myself getting the instructions and I feel which crystals I need to pick up and how I need to arrange them in patterns on each different person. Since crystals are receptors and transmitters, they can realign energy. They generate a low level of electricity that will increase when squeezed. I feel I'm definitely intuitively guided as to what, pick, uh, what kind of crystals to pick. And most of what I use are quartz crystals and fluorite. OK, so what we're going to do today is we're going to open and balance your chakras. So I'm going to be channeling healing energies. We work on the chakras. In the first uh, session of this healing, that's what we do. We open and balance the chakras, which are seven major energy centers on the body. So normally, I will be placing the crystals on the chakras, and then I'll be channeling energy to those chakras. OK. So I'm just going to set these, crust these baskets up on you that will hold crystals. is basically it's sort of like being a, a radio receiver like um, because there there's energy that's flowing all around us and what I do is I tune in to healing energies and I bring those through my body and they come out out of my hands crystals have an innate intelligence. Crystals store information and intelligence, and they are able to um, vibrate at a certain frequency that attracts in certain energies, certain healing energies. And when I'm done, then what we're going to do is we're going to balance your energy. I'm going to use some crystals to realign and balance all your energies. And um, also, I'm going to be guided by your higher self, and we're going to use crystals on your body as I'm guided by your higher self. After Rena balances her clients' energies, her next step is to channel their higher selves. The thing we need to understand is that any disease, whether it be a physical disease, emotional disease, or mental disease, is really just a manifestation of what's going on in the person's aura. So all diseases is a result of some kind of an imbalance in the aura. And the root causes of all disease are basically the same. It's what's called, what I call, a separation from your soul essence. Okay, I see you. And, um, I see you in a field. Mm -hmm. I see you in a field. There's a lot of green. I see, you're probably about 12 years old. It is scientifically proven that crystals have innate energy. Crystals, like the ocean, produce negative ions which charge the air and make you feel better. I feel the presence of a higher self, and I start to get messages. I hear things, I see things. Uh, in whatever way the higher self wants to give me the message, I get it. What your higher self is telling me is that um, you, something happened. What is soul energy? Soul energy 
Boy, that's a good question. <laughs> Soul energy is, um, it's the essence of you. In other words, you know, we focus so much on the physical reality. The truth is that our physical body is just a vehicle. If you take away the physical body, there is still a soul. There is an intelligence about us. And that soul is an energy. And we have merely um, incarnated in a physical body. I see that at this moment, this is the time when you made a decision that um, you were one of the have-nots. If you knew that you were connected to God, if you knew that you had a soul energy that had no limitation, you would act differently. And when it's one thing to know that intellectually, but it is a very, very different thing to feel it. Whether it's the crystal itself or the people who have learned to harmonize its energies, crystals can connect us to our true selves, our soul. As a simple parlor trick, hypnosis can be fun and entertaining. But take it one step further, and this powerful tool can be used or misused in a number of ways. After all, who is in control? A woman is put under hypnosis, and a hypnotist places a coin on her bare forearm. Though the coin is cold, the hypnotist tells his subject it is extremely hot, hot enough to burn. The coin is removed, and within an hour, a blister appears on the woman's arm. Three days later, the burn mark still remains. So how's all this possible? I mean, a cold piece of metal shouldn't be able to burn. So what's the explanation? Here, the power of the subconscious mind a power that is being used by hypnotists to help people break bad habits, overcome phobias, and in rare cases, even heal disease. This is the forearm of a 16-year-old known as the Elephant Skin Boy. These are his feet. His condition, caused by the absence of oil-forming glands in his skin, created an armor-like plating over most of his body. Incredibly, he was cured with hypnosis. Here is the boy's forearm before treatment, and here is the same arm just one week later after being told, while under hypnosis, that his condition would simply disappear. Here are his legs before and again after. Conservatively speaking, the power of hypnotism is awesome, but how does it work? I asked Gil Boyne, director of the Hypnotism Training Institute of Los Angeles. Hypnotism is a natural state of mind. That means it's within the nature of every human being to enter into a state of trance under the right set of conditions. In oriental hypnosis, the hypnotizer summons up his prana or life force and is able to narrowly beam it to award that subject to influence them. The Western belief is that the power is in the subject and the hypnotist simply guides it. When I tell a person I'm going to hypnotize them, in my mind, it's already done. And so I transmit that energy. They go into a trance. That's all I can do to explain it. Much of hypnosis remains a mystery. One of the biggest mysteries and controversies in the field of hypnotism is who is in control, the hypnotist or his subject. I asked Gil to hypnotize my colleague, Susan O'Leary, in order to get her first-hand opinion on the matter. Initially, Susan did not seem like a good subject and sleep that's fine turn loose now relax let your eyelids close down but i can't <laughs> but eventually she fell into a trance all right three two one right down into the chair that's good now just keep relaxing it's quite easy first susan is told that her eyelids are locked shut when she tries to open them she cannot next she's instructed to stiffen her arm as though it were made of steel Notice how it shakes as she attempts to bend it. Later, Gil has Susan clasp her hands together tightly. As you can see, the suggestion is so powerful that in carrying it out, Susan actually begins to cut off the blood flow going to her fingers. And it's not until Gil tells her to release them 
that she is able to pull her hands apart. After Susan came too, we all talked. Are you was, convinced you were hypnotized? I don't know. I was convinced I couldn't do certain things. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, with well, my, my hands mainly. Yeah. I thought maybe they were like entwined, funny, and I couldn't see because my eyes were closed. I opened my eyes, and then I can still see that I can't get them apart. And sure. I remember thinking how stupid that was that I couldn't uh, get them apart. But <laughs> you really tried, though. Oh, I really tried. Yeah, I really tried. That's so, right. Yeah. In this session, Susan was in the hands of a conscientious hypnotist. But there are others out there who are not as principled as Mr. Boyne. There's a case I'm, I'm going to be a witness for the prosecution in which a hypnotist hypnotized a woman and then unbuttoned or loosened certain portions of her clothing and uh, massaged her. When she came up from the trance, she remembered that and went immediately to the police. They agreed to set up a sting. While the police monitored the situation on a hidden camera, the hypnotist attempted a second molestation. This time he was stopped before he could complete the act. They brought the film to me to say, was she truly hypnotized? Yes, she was. Could she have been physically seduced? Could she have been sexually assaulted? I believe she could have. I believe she could have. Cases like this are rare, and fortunately, a subject who is pushed to such an extreme does not forget. In almost every case, they will remember afterward, as this woman did, which means you have to be pretty stupid or pretty obsessive as a hypnotist to risk that. In order to safeguard against such crimes, Gilboyne has sought for years to have hypnotist license. But to date, the field of hypnotism remains an unlicensed profession. This combined with the fact that the power of the subconscious is still a largely unexplored entity should give one pause before seeking the help of just any hypnotist. Chances are you'll find someone ethical. But then again, The Kennedys have been called the royal family of America. For decades, they have been the centerpiece of scandal and intrigue. They have also suffered more than their share of tragedy. Could the misfortunes of the Kennedy family be the result of a gypsy curse? From illicit love affairs, to murders, to two assassinations, the biography of the famous Kennedy family reads like a tragic novel. Before Joseph Patrick Kennedy, patriarch of the family, died in the winter of 1969, he blamed the family's misfortune on the malicious curse of an old gypsy woman. A strange thing to admit for a man who was once America's ambassador to England. The story begins as an American dream. Joseph was a fiercely ambitious man. He made his fortune on the stock exchange in the 1920s. Nine children were born from his marriage to Rose. It was the foundation for one of the most powerful families in America. Nothing stood in the way of their prosperity. Also known as a ruthless businessman, Joseph evicted some squatters from his New York tenant houses at one time. Among them, an old gypsy woman who spat in his face and put a curse on the family. The first disasters to strike was the wartime loss of Joseph's oldest son, Joe Jr., followed by the tragic death of daughter Kathleen. Without his firstborn to follow in his footsteps, Joseph Sr. used his power and influence to mold his three remaining sons into the world of politics. Ultimately, one of Joseph Sr.'s sons, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, ascended to the presidency. John F. Kennedy became a legend in American history. Throughout his presidency, he was idolized, and at the same time, he was also isolated in some of his political notions. In Dallas, Texas, on November 22, 1963, he was assassinated in what was first concluded as a single bullet shot. 
It was alleged that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone, firing three shots. One bullet hit JFK in the head. The other two were misfired. Two days later, Oswald was shot and killed in public while under the custody of police. The trail of evidence came to an abrupt halt. Theories and suspicion about JFK's assassination rose with a vengeance, but they were covered up in what was believed to be a governmental conspiracy. Who wanted JFK dead? Between the mob, Fidel Castro's retaliation, and JFK's enemies within his own government, the possibilities were endless. One fact became very clear. JFK's assassination wasn't a mindless raid by a madman, but a very meticulously planned murder. Robert Kennedy, then the Attorney General, pursued the Kennedy battle against crime lords after the death of his brother. He discovered the involvement of the mobsters in the CIA plot to kill Fidel Castro. Senator Kennedy has been shot. On June 5th, 1968, Robert Kennedy was assassinated. Once again, the Kennedys mourned. And possibly shot in the head. The youngest of the Kennedy sons, Edward, now became the only prospect for the Kennedy clan to go to the White House. Elected as U.S. Senator from Massachusetts, political triumph laid within his grasp until the early mornings of July 18, 1969, when he drove his car off the bridge into a pond on the small island of Chappaquiddick. This morning, I entered a plea of guilty to the charge of leaving the scene of an accident. Ted's passenger, the young and beautiful Mary Jo Kopechny, was mysteriously restrained in the car until she drowned. So many questions persist. There was no autopsy. Her clothes and belongings were burned. And why did Kennedy flee when he could have gone for help? From there, a long downward spiral of personal dilemma chased Ted Kennedy. Shortly after this, Joseph Kennedy Sr. died, a man with a broken heart. Although the Kennedy family was still ridden with scandals, the seemingly endless tragedies stopped. Did the old gypsy woman's curse die with Joseph Sr.? Could one family possibly be saturated with so much bad luck? Or is it conceivable that amidst all this turmoil, the curse of the old gypsy woman prevailed? One can't help but wonder. <laughs>